Hello, Juliet. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Looking I'm so you. glad to see you and to have you here with me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. I think one of the greatest things that happened to me this year was to meet you, you know. Thank you. That's, that's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful and honored to actually have the possibility of being of service to the European School of Theosophy. That for me is a, is a wonderful thing that has come from this year. So as a teacher, especially being able to help others approach theosophy, perhaps in a, in a different manner is, is really wonderful. It's really wonderful. Thank you, thank you. So we are live now on our YouTube channel, on the YouTube channel of the European School of Theosophy. Hello all. Uh, my name is Erika Georgiadis and today I will be interviewing Juliet Bates. Juliet was born in England, has lived in, in Australia, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, and is now based in Milan. Her study of the ancient wisdom teachings began at an early age expanded by the study of theosophical texts, esotericism, and the study of Kabbalah. She holds a degree in psychology, was a member of the British Psychological Society for 20 years, and is a teacher and translator. She has translated fundamental theosophical texts, giving talks, and taught courses on the wisdom teachings and esotericism for many years. She is also a Reiki master teacher, teaching healing, meditation, and the importance of positive thoughts and the universal unity. She is a TS member of Cohen Bay, Wales, and London, and is currently the European School of Theosophy Managing Editor of Publications and Co-Director of Online Courses. Juliet, I am so happy you are here with me today, <laughs> and uh, we will get to know uh, each other better. And forward to it. Yeah, so could you please tell me how you came in contact with Theosophy for the first time? I think I was actually born a Theosophist already. <laughs> I think that most people um, already have Theosophy in their hearts or in their inner core already from birth, from studies from past lives, perhaps. Um, I just know that as a, as a young child, I'm talking about the age of four, um, I could see lights around people. So perhaps some would say that um, I was clairvoyant as I could see things and see things moving. And um, for me, everything had life. I mean, I had a dog and we had cats and rabbits. And at four, my parents emigrated to Australia and we were out with heaps of, of land and just wandering around. And the life that you could see was not just physical, it was in everything, in, 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 in the rocks, in the land itself. And I thought it was normal um, to see these things. And I felt a connection, what I call a unity with everybody and with everything. And people would remark to my parents that I would stop and talk to everybody and, and try and help everybody already at four, at five, at six. It was something that I would do. And at school, at elementary school, I read my way practically through the entire library, trying to find something that would explain what it was that I was feeling. Um, at the age of nine, my parents put me into a Catholic school for a year which was my first really introduction to a, a standard religion. And though it was wonderful as an experience, I was told things, but it wasn't really enough. I always felt that there was more. And I would say, but why? But okay, and they would say, oh, it's because of this. And I'd feel there was something more. I'd feel there was something more. Then going on to into high school, again, a new library, and we we're in Australia, in Melbourne, there weren't that many books. Until I was around about 12, and I found my first brilliant copy in a, a garage sale, a secondhand sale in the middle of the road, where I found the Mahatma letters. 
And it may seem very silly, but it was as though the questions being asked were my questions of why, why does this happen? Why are we here? Where are we going? What happens when we die? Because people would say eight and nine, what are you asking about where you go when you die? Live your life first. And so from the Mahatma letters, I then moved on and act again in a secondhand bookstall, instead of picking up, you know, a, a romance or Enid Blyton or the very much, I thought, you know, King Arthur tales and Greek legends, which I was very, very fond of, I found um, a very, very old copy of The Key to Theosophy. And I think at that point I was 12 or 13. And that's when I discovered theosophy, theosophy apart from the Mahatma letters, which I didn't really consider theosophy as yet. That was sort of my introduction. And so then at 16, we moved to England and that was a whole different situation. Um, we had libraries, but big libraries there. We had bookshops and I could do a lot more reading. I actually phoned the TS in London and I think in 76, uh, I was born in 58, so you do the maths. Um, I actually caught the train on my own and traveled up to London to speak with somebody um, up at the TS in London and look at their library. And I spent the whole day from, I think, 11 o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon, because my train was at six, just reading through the books and writing the names of books. And the lady there, who I don't remember her name, had suggested which books I should be reading. And that moved me on to, of course, um, Isis Unveiled and Light on the Path, heaps and heaps and heaps of books that I've been gathering and reading ever since. And um, it's been one great study and journey since then. It's just wonderful. So that's, I think, where it all began <laughs> and where it is still continuing because as, as most people, I know absolutely nothing as yet, but I'm looking forward to learning more. You told me uh, you told me you had some uh, psychic experiences uh, when you were a child. Well, well yeah, from, age, when, from when I was from when I was little, I always did. I would see, I would see um, people who had died, and uh, they would come and say goodbye or hello to me before I knew they had died, and I would see them. And I would see the dryads of the trees. I'd go past the trees in the forest and sort of the, what I thought they were fairies of the trees, the tree spirits would rein out with their hair and, and say hello. And I was always very respectful because before going, and this is something that I've always done, but even up to today, if I visit a new place, a new town, the first thing I do is, is ask respect, you know, to enter that place. And I don't go up and hug a tree. I ask permission of the tree if I can draw close because I know they are a living, conscious um, entity of some sort. And um, that's why I don't really like being hugged or touched too much because if I do shake hands with someone or someone hugs me, I tend to pick up um, vibrations and feelings or something from them which of course may be personal for them. They're not aware of it. And I certainly don't want it, so, you know, fair enough. But um, I thought everybody could do it, to be honest. I, I really did. I think, and I think anybody can do it because when I became a mother, certainly I knew when my kids were sick. And I think any mother does. If your kids, are on, when they're older, they're away for the night or you're out for dinner and they're with a babysitter. You get that gut feeling that there's something wrong at home. Um, and I think everybody has that feeling. And it, it comes on an energy frequency, on a vibration, which comes from love, but universal love, not I love ice cream love. And I think anybody can do that, which is one of the things, you know, you do in meditation, you open yourself and you expand to embrace more than just what we are within all closed in just me 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 when you open up you feel you feel when your dog is sick I mean you, you feel those things and if you listen to that little voice that feeling 
it then grows and you become more sensitive perhaps. But um, yeah, it has been a, a wonderful thing and it is what guides me um, along my path and it, it's wonderful. It, I think I did not have a happy or a very um, pleasant childhood. So I think what kept me sane was the idea that don't my my parents were not a happy situation. Um, I was connected not just to them, but to everything. And, and that kept me sane. Um, it was just joy everywhere. The light that I would see around people, around nature. Um, there was just such joy, really. So would, would you say that perhaps that the joy, that joy you didn't have um, in your childhood or perhaps in your family environment, as you say, you find it um, elsewhere? And I, I think it permeates everything. And in reading, you know, in studying theosophy and studying secret doctrine, I understood, you know, the way that all of the energies come down, especially in my studies of the Kabbalah as well, uniting, um, you know, specific texts with Madame Blavatsky's teachings as well. Um, you get a very, very clear picture. There are a lot of correspondences and if you take the time to work out the correspondences and then and, and to think about and meditate upon it you see the way energy comes down and just expands out to everything that I always say to people when they say oh Julie I'm not happy I'm not happy I want a boyfriend or I want a dog or I want a child or I want a new job I said, it's not going to be a new boyfriend or a new husband or another child that will make you happy if you're not happy within yourself. You have to first be happy within yourself. If you open yourself and, and just it comes perhaps even from, from gratitude, from just being nice to people. Um, you know, in English, we say that like attracts like and birds of a feather flock together. If you are nice to people, I think nice people tend to come around you, too. It's your choice of who, of how you want to live your life. You know, um, I've, I've said this to you before, I think that you can choose in your life. Um, and I, I don't want to preach to anybody. This is purely my my situation, my idea, limited though it may be. A person can choose to be a victim or to be a survivor. And um, I've been through some tough stuff. I mean, there's always someone that's been through worse. But I prefer to be a survivor. And I think that the capacity that I have to love unconditionally people that I don't even know or to give myself to people at the risk of my own life, for example, to people that I don't know, um, comes from that opening up and trusting in, in that energy that we have around us. Um, I really do think that the world is built on energy that is pure love. I, I really do. And I don't want to be all, you know, funny or whatever, but I, I really do. Um, I think people have it in them to be incredible people and to do amazing, incredible things if they don't doubt themselves. Um, people can be really wonderful. Yes, and then, you know, this, this positive attitude that you have is very important because um, it helps um, you and others around you also to move forward. So you are a person that a lot of people, they reach out to you for help, exactly because of this attitude that you have of being positive, um, even though you are a survivor, as, as you say, um, what would you, what would be your suggestion for someone who wants to be more positive, who wants to change their way of seeing things, and becoming better and perhaps getting in touch with this energy of love you emphasize so much. 
that's that's a very good question and it it changes for every person because it depends on what level of unhappiness or difficulty they are facing for example someone who has just lost a child or not been able to say goodbye to their husband who has died during the covid pandemic or something like that you're going to have to wait several years before you can actually come out of that i mean those those are a, a terribly trying emotional times of course but for someone who is simply living and trying to get on perhaps not happy with their job perhaps not happy with with their husbands their children with their friends or whatever um i always say what do you want and they say i want to be happy okay so if you think that someone can just leave not a husband but leave a boyfriend or leave a girlfriend or change their job or they don't want to live in the city anymore it's always fear that blocks them i said why don't you know if he hits you why don't you leave him why don't you look for a new job oh but if i don't find another job if i don't do this i said but it's fear that is blocking you but i don't deserve it but that's something different you know people have their own different um chains that are binding them maybe they were told that they weren't worth loving maybe they were told that they weren't intelligent but they weren't good when they were growing up they didn't get i didn't get any of that and it didn't seem to bother me too much but normal people in a normal family in a normal situation would expect their mum to love them to look after them and to be positive and to to nurture them and to help them grow so people can't look at tomorrow when they're in trouble so i say well where do you see yourself in 5 years where would you like to be in 5 years because even a year or two years is too close because christmas is coming maybe it might be 6 months to christmas and i say well i don't want to be on my own if i leave my boyfriend i'm on my own for christmas i'm on my own for new years what do i do at home on my own and this is the priority you know <laughs> this is the priority in some people's lives but if you talk about 5 years into the future it's far enough away for them to think well i i would like to have children i said okay does your boyfriend want you oh no he doesn't want children i said well what would you do or would you see yourself in the same job oh no i will have a different job or i'm happy or i won't live in milan the city i want to live by the sea i want to open um a hairdresser salon okay and in 5 years oh i see that i've opened it so already by saying what do you see further in the future for yourself they start to sow the seeds of the possibility of it happening because some people don't see that they've only received no never mind you don't deserve it but everyone deserves it karma aside everyone deserves to to look for their happiness and by helping others i think they do so you you basically suggest that the person stops and see where the person would like to be in 5 years and 6 years from now and he starts imagining and yeah. working towards that direction isn't it yeah, by saying where would you see yourself in 5 years they have to get out of their troubled place now in their head and move it ahead far enough so that they can't see the journey yeah. but they can see it okay. and so it's something that's like a bit of a dream it's a bit like what would you want from father christmas you know it's a possibility so i think about some people want to be happy want to change their life but they've got no idea what to put on that list of what to do of how to do it and you can't say read a book yeah juliet um you are a reiki master and you have been uh, um uh practicing healing for how many years for how many years oh i've i started doing reiki when i was in singapore um i studied under a reiki master and that was in 1982 1982 yeah yeah so a very long time so now uh, we, are, we are starting a healing circle 
at the European School of Theosophy. The Healing Circle, you will be running uh, in 2021. It would you like to, to comment a bit about it, both about your experience as uh, okay. when, it, when it comes down, when it comes down to healing, um, again, I think, and this we know from the ancient wisdom teachings, we are capable of healing ourselves to a certain extent. Our bodies are um, conditioned by our mind. And if our mind, if we feel cold, but our mind convinces us that we are warm, we actually will raise our body temperature. So mind is very, very important when it comes to facing any sort of difficulty, emotional or physical, or any sort of fear or anything like that. So the first thing that you do in healing is to get someone to relax and just let go. Because without realizing it, everybody is carrying a weight on their shoulder. The expectations that they have, the expectations other people have for them, their worries and their fears, which is a word we find all the time. Um, so by releasing that, we open ourselves because we let go and we release it. And oh, you just breathe. I could call my five-year-old granddaughter in and I say, what do you do when you're stressed? And she goes, oh, I breathe, Nana, at five. Oh, and she just releases it. Once you've released that, you can then start to send out an intention of healing for yourself or for others. Because if you're all stressed and all like this, you can't heal anything. You can't heal, help anybody. You need to open your arms for a hug. And all healing is, is sharing a healing energy to give strength for someone else in accordance with their free will and with their karmic responsibilities. Obviously, you cannot change. You cannot go against free will and you cannot go against somebody's karma. But by just breathing and relaxing and just letting yourself go, that is a gift, I think, already for a lot of people today. And then by sending a positive intention out, it mind mind forms, I mean, you know, thought forms <laughs> are a reality. If you're thinking positive thoughts, you live in a positive world. If you're sending out negative thoughts, that's what you're going to be living with. So send out positive thoughts, please, everybody. Yeah, so, so the, the, it's important, as you emphasize, to have, uh, to be relaxed, to yeah. be at peace in order to, to, to heal ourselves or yes. to engage into any healing practice. Uh, could you share a bit about the plans of creating the healing circle for the European School of Theosophy 2021? Okay, well, um, it was thought that as the full moon is usually the time where energies are the strongest between you know, the, the, the waxing moon, so when you have a new moon to when it goes to full moon, that is the, the strongest sort of energies that we have. And as women, we will understand that. We thought it would be nice if perhaps on a Sunday, one Sunday a month, just before, um, an hour before we have our usual lecture on a Sunday, um, we set aside 20 minutes, 30 minutes, for anyone who wants to join without any problems at all, just to link in with us, to join us on our, on our Zoom channel and just participate in self-healing for themselves, if that's what they would like to do. And if they are in that space where they are happy also to expand that wellness out to other people, to send it to their families and their friends and out to their country and out to the world, specifically and that is done very very simply just through a breathing exercise just relaxing which is a guided exercise which I give which will be I believe in our December newsletter so people can see exactly what it is that I will be saying and what we will be doing so they'll be aware of it they'll be familiarized with it and then just sending an invocation out to the devas to the angels to the healers to whoever it is that you would say your prayers or your intentions to and ask them to send their healing and to help us with this healing process for ourselves, for our planet, for everybody here and everyone around, including nature itself. 
it's, it's a very simple thing to do, um, but it's something that at the European School of Theosophy, we thought perhaps was something that we could help people with if they needed this. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if you're feeling that you would like to participate in, in a very simple a meditation or practice like this in healing and sending healing to others, please, please join us in January. The dates will be in the newsletter in December. We have a very full program next year. Lots yeah. of wonderful things happening. It's a very exciting time. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yes. Uh, Juliet, uh, could you share a bit, um, comment a little on the course that you have prepared for uh, the European well, I have to, I'm, I'm a teacher, so you ask me about courses. I, I get comfortable sit on the end of, on, on the corner of on the corner of the desk. Yes, well, right. Um, on the yeah, based on yeah. Where is the book? My, uh, my book, my book, Deity, yeah. Cosmos, and Man, the first book. Um, one of the, one of the first books that I had, and I hadn't told you this, Erica was uh, as I have a signed copy of um, this one here, Exploring the Great Beyond. I have a signed copy by Jeffrey Farthing. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. This is, is a first edition and it's a signed copy uh, from 1978. I got it in 79. Um, so just, I, just, I- Just a parenthesis. Jeffrey Farthing was one of the founders of the European School of Theosophy. I close. We go full circle, isn't it? We go literally go full circle. The yeah. things that I was looking for and the things that I learned my basics from, and that not only basics, because you think it's basic, like ABC, but if you don't have ABC, you can't read Shakespeare. You certainly can't read The Secret Doctrine without ABC and a bit of mathematics. So um, when Erica said, you know, we're thinking of of doing um, courses on the Jeffrey Farthing books. Oh, I've got all of them. I have all of the Farthing books, all of them. It's yes, I've got a lot. I have a very extensive library. But um, so Deity, Cosmos and Man, I, I was thrilled to take this book. I was absolutely thrilled. Um, I know it's been the text and it's, you can see all my notes, my bits and pieces all the way through it. And I've written on practically all of the pages. <laughs> all the way through it <laughs> teacher and student oh, you're not like me i do the same yeah, yeah i underline everything and i put i stick notes in it when i've got questions if i have a question that comes from the text i write it down so i remember to go and look for the answer somewhere else and that which brings to mind another question so when i was asked to uh, say what do you think about maybe preparing a course on jeffrey farthing i thought wow deity cosmos of man that's fantastic and she said, yeah, just do some quizzes. And I said, oh no, we need to do more than that. We need to make this a journey. Um, I become very enthusiastic as a teacher and I like to accompany my students and to, to see that light in their eye when they understand something, they sort of, no, I don't get it. I don't understand. Yes, because if you, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay, try doing it this way. And then you get that expression in their eyes where the eyes light up. And then the mouth opens and it's, I've got it. And that moment, that eureka moment is what a teacher lives for because you have given them something precious and forever, as I can say with my Jeffrey Farthing books, you have something which is precious for the rest of your life. And not only for you, it's a seed that you will then plant for other people as well. So we, I planned um, 10 self-assessment questions for each chapter because the book is divided in two parts because Jeffrey Farthing was a very astute and a, a very knowledgeable teacher and he, an incredible man. He really was an incredible man because he would give you enough, like a fisherman, he would throw that bait in and give you just enough to get you excited and interested. And then when you bit it, he would then put you in and say, read the second part of the book, which is the difficult bit. But you already know enough from the beginning. So the part two wasn't as bad as it would have been if he'd given you that to start with, if I'm making any sense. So to help students sort of between one chapter and another, because each chapter is on a specific topic. So you've got karma, uh, the hierarchies of beings, death and dying, 
globes, chains and races, which is everybody's favourite, of course, you know, everybody wants a question on which globe we're on and what chain, we're, what route race we're on. So I've written something called Connecting the Dots, which is a bit amusing and it adds a bit of help between I, one I just love it. I love it. I love the <laughs> connecting the dots. I just love it. Go on. I'll tell you one thing. This course hadn't even started. I haven't met, I haven't the name of one student to do the course. But when it came, I mean, there were 14 chapters in part one, 14 chapters in part two, plus a welcome and an introduction, plus an introduction for part two. So we're talking 28, 29, 30. When it came to writing my 32nd piece to give my farewell, my congratulations, well done, you've made it to the end of this course. When I got to the end of it, I was moved. I, I actually, I was in tears. My daughter, I went out and my daughter, mum, what's wrong? I said, I finished my course. And she hugged me because I was, I was upset that I'd finished the course. I'd finished accompanying these students on this magnificent journey together. And that is something I believe in, that we are never alone. No, but uh, sorry, I have to say something. The closing you have done for the course is very touching. <laughs> I mean, even me, when we were filming it, I cried. No, I was, I was very touched. It was you kept saying, and you the, kept feeling, saying. the feeling that you had in closing the course, yeah. you managed to pass it through the text. <laughs> it's a very, very touching text. You know, you know, I, it is, I don't know. I loved it. I mean, I, I uh, my vocation is as a teacher. I was teaching my dolls when I was three. I'd have them all lined up and I was teaching. It, I, I am a teacher by vocation. And um, whatever I can teach, whether I'm teaching meditation, whether I'm teaching ritual, whether I'm teaching Kabbalah, whether I'm teaching, you know, um, a theosophical text or something, whatever it is, um, it, it's just wonderful. And Deity Cosmos and Man, in reading through this, um, as always, when you read a book, you get, like when you watch a film, you see certain things. When you go back and you read it a second time or you watch the film a second time, you pick up more because you're not following the story. You can see the background a bit more. And each time you read it, each time you look into it, because people say, oh, I've read that, I've read that, you know, I've read The Secret Doctrine. Oh, did you really? How many times? Once. Really? Well, that tells me everything I need to know about you, really. I mean, you know. But when I was reading through this, I realized that there was a piece of poetry in there by uh, Christina Rossetti, which Madame Blavatsky had quoted also. And I said, I remember reading that. And I am the sort of person that when they see a quote, when they see a couple of lines, I go and check it. I look at the footnotes, I go and check it. I go and buy the other books to see what it is that inspired them to write this. And so um, I decided to actually um, do something specific on that, on the inspiration of that poem, which is what I'm doing on my, in my talk in December, on the 9th of December, it's based on inspiration from texts and from film and from, from music and from whatever, based basically on something that Jeffrey Farthing gave me, that Madame Blavatsky gave him and that he has given through this book, if it wasn't enough to see it already, uh, to pass out to someone else. Um, yeah, you have they're, to... all, they're all pieces which are, they go back to me saying that a seeker on the path is never alone. I always believe for the road and for the first part of the path, we are always with someone. It's true that that last part, when you go through the portals, when you're building your antikarana, then you are on your own in the sense that you go through sort of like that long dark night of St. John, as they would say, um, and you have to, you are tested. And so at that point you need to really be in touch with yourself and, and that you have to do on your own. It's like giving birth. You can have people with you, but you've got to do it on your own. At the end of the day, you do it on your own. And it's very much the same sort of thing. But all of the pieces that I've chosen um, for, for the talk in December are, dialogues between two people where you have the teacher and you have a student 
And in Uphill by Christina Rossetti, you have someone saying, but does the path, does the journey really take all day? And the teacher saying, yes, it does, you know. And there are always things where you have one person asking and the other person being supportive, not giving the answer, but being supportive, saying, yes, go on a little bit further. But will we rest? Yes, we will all rest together. We'll all be happy together later on. And I think this is wonderful, this idea of, of studying, being on a journey together, be, finding this inspiration together. And that's what I would like people to know. They are not alone. Nobody is ever alone unless they choose to be, unless they want to be and they choose to be. Otherwise, they are not. I think that's, that's a very, very important uh, point, uh, Juliette, because there is a lot of people feeling lonely, especially now during the pandemics with the lockdowns. And then I think that's, that's very important. And I think that the fact that you will emphasize that you were never alone in your lecture is, is a very, uh, it's a must. Um, in the period we, we, we are living today. And then I found very interesting your proposal. You know, I was thinking about it because uh, we are going to publish some books at the European School of Theosophy. Actually, we are ahead. We are planning perhaps to make a publishing house. And then Juliet suggested that we should compile all the poetry used by HPB on Lucifer magazine. Yeah. And then I was thinking about it because every time, Juliet, I write a lecture, if I put a small poetry in the beginning, if I add it, it's because I want to pass a message yeah. that only the poetry, the, the poem can pass. Yeah. Um, so of course, all the poetry used by HPB and in, the, in Lucifer, it is there for a reason because yeah. she wants to pass a message through that poetry. Yeah. And this is something that um, nobody looks really, uh, nobody pays attention. Well, I haven't heard uh, of any work focusing on the poetry used by HPB, for example, which also, um, yeah. so uh, could you please, what, what do you think about, what do you had in mind in terms of publication when you suggested it? Well, for the poetry, yeah. Um, well, one is you have to remember that uh, I have a background in study on Kabbalah, which shows a lot of correspondences between one thing and another. So if you know something, for example, if people have studied astrology or, or planets or something, they'll know that, oh, for example, if you're talking about Mars, Mars is to do with war or whatever. So if Mars appears somewhere else, you can think that that will also be a correspondence in that. We also learn that words have their own energy. They have their own numerical formula. Mabel Collins wrote a lot about that. Um, what's her name? Uh, Grace Nock, was it, wrote about that as well. A lot of people, Blavatsky herself wrote about that, the importance of the word. People read a stanza. They read a chapter, they read the book. They don't take into consideration the word, the individual words and the keys are in the words, not reading between the lines, but in the words. If somebody has ever tried to write a poem or to write a difficult letter, a condolence letter, for example, each word is painstakingly considered and selected and thought. You choose one adjective rather than another. You want it to flow properly in a certain way. And as you said, in my closing, the words that I used brought an emotion because words put into a certain order are like music, they flow in waves. And poetry has to be read aloud. And if you read poetry aloud, it's like singing. It's like listening to music. You can't listen to music with the, with the audio off. You have to have this. And the way that you read it, I think that there is, is nothing more romantic than having the person that you love or you're interested in of a quiet evening 
just sitting down, looking out at the sunset or something, and he's reciting poetry to you. I mean, what more can you ask for? I mean, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And looking at some of the poetry, and these, this is poetry that was printed in Lucifer. I mean, it is inspiring stuff and it's been completely overlooked. I was thinking about this in, in preparing my talk. We have had, we had Founders Day, what, yesterday? We celebrated Founders Day, 145 years of the Theosophical Society founded in Nadia. And the inspiration that we have had, the women, the inspirational women that we have had in the 1850s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, at a time when women didn't have a soul, they weren't allowed to have property, um, they couldn't do anything practically, but they were there in the thick of it, demanding rights, they were writing, they were creating, they were thinking far beyond male counterparts, far beyond scientific thought. And this came out very often in their poetry because they couldn't write letters to the editor. They couldn't write in magazines and newspapers. So they wrote books, they wrote stories, they wrote poetry and the poetry, especially Christina Rossetti's poetry has oh a strength to it that, that really is incredible. And other people that I will then, then mention later on as well. Um, it's just it's just amazing we have so much to be inspired by by looking at these people who lived in very difficult times that okay we're going through a, a pandemic we're going through difficulties that some people really do not have food to put on the table i mean some people really are in in, in terrible terrible circumstances but for a lot of people they're home with noisy husbands, wives, children, boyfriends, girlfriends, families, or whatever, complaining a lot about things, but it could be a lot worse. They have their televisions, they've got their heating, they've got food on the table. Okay, there's fear about tomorrow, but there's also hope in tomorrow. There's gratitude that they're still well and healthy, you know, and that comes out, I think, in the poems that we can see, the Wilfred Owen poems, of the First World War in the trenches. I, I can't read those without crying. I don't think anybody can. Yes, yes. Um, Juliet, can you believe that we are talking one hour? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I talk and too much. We haven't talked about, anyway, um, I would like to ask if you have any poem that you love at hand, uh, so we could close our meeting with you reading the poem. But before that, before that, yes, uh, could you comment a bit on the new course that you were going to work on uh, based on Farthing book, uh, The Mystical Kabbalah? Oh, the new one, that's the one that you're doing, Death and Dying, because we did two intuitive courses, which I really recommend, which are all, we did three courses in the space of two months. Talk about working inspired. No, my my dream, literally my dream job. Uh, this is this is where we are lucky. This is when service really becomes a dream. And I'm blessed to be able to create a course based on Jeffrey Farthing's book, Kabbalah and Theosophy, um, from the writings of Blavatsky. And um, this is something that literally I can Put my teeth into and add something to and um, this is going to take a bit longer to get done because it's uh, to do it properly to help people literally get an understanding people do not lead, need to learn Hebrew or quantum mathematics or anything like that it's, it's not that complicated but um, it, it, I think people will be amazed to see how Kabbalah with the Ein, Ein Sof, Ein Sofor is literally the four hat coming down. The, uh, I, 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 I get goosebumps when I think about it. Yeah, I, I, I realize that. I, it's funny that I was, uh, this book was first released 
at the summer school of the TS in England in 2012. And I was there because I was lecturing and then I was there when the book was released. And it's a compilation of always whatever HPB says about yeah. Kabbalah. And it's a very, very interesting work. And I'm, I'm really looking forward. To it's going to be, um, yeah. it, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge to weave it all together for someone who has no idea of Kabbalah of what it is. So I've got to be able to put the structure. The only thing to remember about Kabbalah is that you have three columns. You have the two polarities of severity and mercy because you can't have wisdom without justice or justice without wisdom. And those are the two, the two extremes. And in the mystic path, which is what we want to be. We want to be on the middle path. The path, when we talk about spiritual path, it's the middle path. But to get to the middle path, we are a pendulum and we swing too angry in this way. We love, we love a lot and we don't like someone, we don't like them a lot. And then we swing back to balance. And then in balance, we move up. And all we have to do is that middle pillar. And that's what I have to incorporate onto the tree of life. So it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be, it'll drive me mental. I've, I've got notes already about that thick. I mean, I've got notes everywhere, bits of paper everywhere. We have to, we have to close another, 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 talk, another chat. <laughs> Wait for the course. <laughs> Wait for the course. Talk about the course. I don't think I have a, um, one of the, of the poems. All of the pieces of paper and everything I've got around here. Um, I don't know if I've got the, if I've got Christina's poem here somewhere, if I actually printed it out or if it's on my, on my computer. Right. I'm trying to save paper. Mm -hmm. That's the intuitive course, the healing circle, the other course. That's bits and pieces from slides and things. I've never prepared a slide in my life and I have to prepare slides for the 9th of December. Definitely a learning curve. Yeah, on the 9th of, of December, you were gonna be presenting your first yes. lecture. I, I haven't got it. I'd have to go off here. On I'm looking forward to it. Don't, yeah. worry. Don't what, worry. What I will read, what I will read with great joy, I have two pieces that are stuck here in my study and that are stuck in my bedroom next to my bed. And um, they are the last two slides of my talk because it's where I have my inspiration from. Actually, to be, and that is the golden stairs. Yes. The golden stairs of Blavatsky. Okay, let's close with the golden stairs. I think that the golden stairs says it all. Yes. And that mm. is a clean life an open mind, a pure heart, an eager intellect, an unveiled spiritual perception, a brotherliness for one's co-disciple, a rest to give and receive advice and instruction, a loyal sense of duty to the teacher, a willing obedience to the behests of truth, once we have placed our confidence in and believe that teach to be in possession of it. A courageous endurance of personal injustice, a brave declaration of principles, a valiant defense who are unjustly and a constant eye to the ideal of human progression and perfection which the secret science depicts. These are the golden stairs up the steps of which the learner may climb to the temple of divine wisdom. And that for me gives me goose pimples each time because it says everything. That says everything and it, it just fills me with joy because it says those, that says everything. That says everything. If you want to be at peace, that says everything. But then I'm simple. <laughs> Thank you so much, Juliet, for being here with me tonight. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the end. Uh, we are closing our our chat. Uh, thank you for all who are watching us on on uh, on uh, on YouTube. 
and we will be releasing this interview uh, in the newsletter of the European School of Theosophy uh, in the week that Juliet will present her lecture. So wish you all a good night.